Greetings all. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining this HSR 2020 satellite session on expanding digital financial services for health to support the scale up of universal health coverage. Apply, please. I'll start with a quick introduction of our speakers and the format for the session. My name is Sri Barkaran and I'm a senior technical advisor for health financing at Palladium. I'm joined by my colleague, Liz Narad, who is a di director for digital solutions at Palladium as well. Next, we're very fortunate to be joined by NG and Dilly, country director for Farm Access Foundation and Matt Guilford, co-founder and CEO of Common Health. Last, we have Arin Dada, who is senior technical director and health economist at Palladium. Next slide, please. Our agenda for the next two hours is as follows. I'll start with an introduction to digital financial services for health, why it's important, how it pertains to UHC aspirations, and what potential it has, particularly in the current moment. Liz will take us up level to explore the DFS ecosystem, discuss applications outside the health sector, and some of the enablers and barriers to increased adoption before she poses some key considerations for DFS to support the UHC agenda. And today we'll present on the role DFS has played in advancing the UHC agenda in Nigeria, working in concert with state-based health insurance schemes along the application in Kenya. And finally, Matt will present on the role DFS can play in health systems context where UHC reforms are more nascent and there is a live scope for private sector intervention. We'll touch on applications in Bangladesh and Myanmar. Arin will lead us through a moderated Q&A, starting with results from a couple of poll questions we shall pose between the country presentations. We look forward to a lively discussion at that point. Next slide, please. So why are digital financial services for health important? Because there is a still a significant proportion of the global population who are unbanked. Data from 2017 indicates 1.7 billion people globally do not have a bank account, 65% of adults in the developing world. This is down from over 2 billion people in 2014, but still a significant number of people who face challenges every day to transact and save, but also to access health care when needed and avoid catastrophic health expenditure. Nevertheless, two thirds of this 1.7 billion people own a mobile phone, and that could help facilitate their access to financial services and products that support their health. Millions of the digitally connected but unbanked people live in just a handful of countries, and we'll hear more about DFS4H interventions in Nigeria and Bangladesh in today's session. DFS4H has the potential to bring the unbanked along the journey to UHC. Next slide, please. Now that we've quantified who the target population is for DFS4H interventions, it is important to understand some of their characteristics. We can see here that there are twice as many unbanked adults in the bottom quintile compared to the top, and 50% of all unbanked populations belong to the bottom quintiles. Unbanked adults are also more likely to be women, highlighting a gender disparity that may affect access to resources for healthcare, and that could be corrected to some extent through the autonomy and empowerment delivered by a mobile phone. In the third chart, you can see that 72% of unbanked are out of the labor force unemployed or self-employed. In other words, being unbanked is a characteristic of the informal sector, which is also the sector that has proven hardest to reach with UHC reforms such as national health insurance schemes. DFS4H offers the potential to bridge that gap. And lastly, we, see, we can see that almost two thirds of the unbanked population have a primary education or less. This is important when considering the design and complexity of DFS4H offerings and something my colleagues in Jide and Matt will touch on further. When we consider these characteristics together, we can see that the unbanked are likely to face greater health risks and are more prone to catastrophic health expenditure. Next slide, please. Now that we have seen the scale and complexity of issues associated with unbanked populations, what are digital financial services and why would they be of use? Broadly, digital financial services refer to financial services such as banking, insurance, payments, investments, that are accessed or enabled by digital channels, including phones, computers, electronic cards, and vouchers. My colleague Liz will explore the state of these various applications in more detail. So at this point, I'll just hint at a few of the preconditions for a successful application of digital financial services. First, there is a need to, for reasonable mobile mo mo phone penetration and potentially smartphone penetration for more sophisticated DFS applications. 
However, as Matt will attest, there is much that can be done even in context with limited smartphone pe penetration, such as Bangladesh. Next, reliable internet and mobile data connectivity and affordability is a critical enabler and one that also ties into the last factor listed here, which is appropriate regulatory landscapes for that facilitate unique secure identification of users. This will underpin the security, reliability, and thus acceptability of any DFS4H platform or service. Next slide, please. So why are DFS increasingly important? Well, I mentioned at the beginning that those who are unbanked, two thirds of which have a mobile phone. In fact, that proportion is expected to increase significantly. The extension of mobile phones and digital connectivity is continuing to increase at an accelerating pace, far faster than the rate of traditional banking and financial services. This creates an opportunity to leverage technology to deliver digital financial services for health. You can see on this slide some of the projections made by the GSMA in 2020 for the level of growth that we see by 2025. A fourfold increase in global mobile data usage. And in Africa, that's actually projected to be eightfold. 1.2 billion additional mobile internet users are mostly projected to come from Asia and Africa as well. And while to date growth in mobile phone usage in developing countries has been driven by affordable basic phones, smartphone adoption is rapidly increasing, along with the infrastructure connectivity upgrades to 3G and 4G services. Next slide. Please. So given the need expressed by the significant unbanked, po unbanked population, and the tailwinds for digital financial services adoption. How do we apply DFS for health? Next slide. I think it's first important to recognize what's come before the relatively new field of DFS for health. mHealth has been around for over a decade and is defined by the WHO as simply the use of mobile and wireless technologies to support the achievement of health objectives. You may, may all be familiar with several of these applications, from electronic health records to HRH planning tools to inventory and supply chain management platforms. At the same time, financial inclusion for health has also been a focus for quite... Next, sorry, next slide, please. At the same time, financial inclusion for health has also been a focus for quite some time, with many health financing reforms focused on strengthening both supply side and demand side financing. Historically, these reforms often have minimal reliance on technology, such as a voucher scheme for the poor to access specified health services at a nearby clinic or a village, and sa village settings and loan program. In other instances, these reforms try to correct for the issue of being unbanked or underbanked through the provision of microcredit or insurance. However, due to the verification required to engage with formal financial services, these often operate at low volume and lack the ability to scale beyond a discrete intervention with a known set of beneficiaries. Next slide, please. We can think of digital financial services for health as operating at the intersection of these two fields, addressing some of the issues that historically faced financial inclusion for health programs by le leveraging an, uh, the accelerating rate of device adoption and connectivity among beneficiary populations, and also facilitating links to more traditional M health areas to support a strengthened health system and the UHC agenda. Next slide. So how can the DFS for Health ad advance the UHC agenda? Here, we've listed several examples of how DFS can be applied to health in ways that increase financial protection, expand population coverage, increase access to essential services, and create a more responsive and accountable health system. Some of the key benefits of digital financial services for health include enhanced security for healthcare-related transactions, improved confidentiality for patient data, increased speed and efficiency of payments with less opportunity for theft and leakage, these are scaling solutions to all populations meeting the minimum preconditions for access, and increased accountability of health system providers through payments for quality. Next slide, please. For DFS applications to be scalable and sustainable, they will eventually require integration into a national health information system architecture. Secure identification of users will likely require any DFS for health applications to be linked with civil registries and insurance verification systems. Applications will also need to verify information with various health information systems, such as electronic health records, master facility registries, and health worker registries. Next slide, please. I'd now like to highlight why the moment is now to seize on the opportunity to expand digital financial services for health. 
Many governments and donors are formulating their policies in relation to digital financial services, acknowledging the rapid acceleration that was already underway, that was further boosted by the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, McKinsey suggests that in the second quarter of 2020, as the world went into various stages of lockdown, digital adoption ad- accelerated by five years in the space of just eight weeks. We've seen governments leverage digital infrastructure to deliver massive stimulus programs that have increased financial protection for health. They've also taken the same moment to update government databases for beneficiaries, addressing exclusion areas that had previously prevented access to subsidized care for millions. Notable examples in this space include India and Pakistan. We've seen efforts to counter the drop in facility visits for non-COVID-19 related healthcare with expanded healthcare to access to telemedicine and health monitoring services. With associated restructuring of digital payment practices for insurers and patients to facilitate the surge in digital usage. We've seen incentive schemes put in place to support frontline workers with top up pay often facilitated through digital technology to ensure it gets to the worker quickly and accurately. Having learned from the successes of this intervention in Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis. And lastly, we've seen governments acknowledge the economic fallout of the pandemic with efforts to ensure loss of employment does not result in loss of insurance coverage, along with efforts to specifically target informal sector workers through digital means to facilitate their health insurance. Some key factors that the pandemic highlighted include the need for robust national ID systems to ensure transfers are efficient, accurate, and timely. The ability for digital transfers to encourage new users to engage with DFS, familiarize with the convenience and functionality it offers, and ultimately earn their trust so they continue to leverage the technology for various means, including health. And lastly, the benefits to payers in using secure, scalable digital transfers and leveraging DFS to collect relevant data, such as health savings account usage and balances. These factors all go well for continued scale up of DFS for Health in support of the UHC agenda. I now hand it over to Liz, who will go into more detail about the DFS ecosystem, some of the enabling factors that have led to increased adoption of DFS and considerations for applying DFS in the health sector. Thanks, Liz. Excellent. Thanks so much, Shree, for that introduction and for the an understanding about how digital financial services for health can really push the UHC agenda. Um, as Shree said earlier, my name is Liz Nirad. I'm a director of digital solutions at Palladium. I work with a team of digital strategists and technologists working to accelerate the adoption and the use of digital technologies really for positive impact and for, for international development goals in general. So what I'm going to do in this section, as Shree said, is take a step back to look at sort of the 30,000 foot view of the digital financial services ecosystem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the important role that digital financial services play in international development in general, um, walk through some use cases and some examples of that, um, especially in regard to achieving the sustainable development goals. I'll give a little bit of a landscape of the the current mobile money industry right now, um, building off of some of the the stats that Sri shared earlier. And finally, I'll end with um, looking at the really the digital financial financial services ecosystem and how we can build off of what has been enabled over the last several years, really in the health context to help us uh, advance progress towards UHC. So to look a little bit deeper into digital financial services and the achievement of global development goals, there are several ways in which we see DFS um, really supporting uh, digital or global development goals in general. So first at the micro level, um, digital financial services help to enable financial inclusion, right? These are the, the stats that Sri started with at the beginning of his presentation. So this is really access to and use of basic financial services, which can help us to reduce poverty, increase resilience, and improve the lives of the poor, particularly women, um, providing economic empowerment. We also see DFS playing a big role in the social protection and humanitarian response space. So we see this um, with cash-based benefits, um, benefits that go towards supporting displaced people or refugees, um, and really seeing that as as a means to scale cash disbursements. We also see that digital financial services can increase the efficiency and the productivity of other sectors. 
So what do we mean by that? Well, simply switching from cash to digital means is more efficient. So it's easier to pay a health worker through digital means. Um, we saw that highlighted in the Ebola crisis, being able to um, get, you know, get payments to our healthcare workers who needed it without having to come into contact, um, you know, and potentially uh, put other people at risk. We also see this in um, administering subsidies to small scale farmers, et cetera. So it really just makes everything more efficient, switching from cash, um, switching from cash to digital. We also see digital financial services helping to improve government accountability and transparency. With a digital means, we have a paper trail, well, actually not a paper trail, but we have you know, a digital trail that can be tracked um, to see traceability of payments and reduce leakage. leakage. Um, and finally, at sort of the macro level, we see um, just switching to a digital economy um, helps bring more money into the formal economy in general and has shown um, it, it's shown a contribution to increasing GDP of countries. So I won't belabor this anymore as we know that digital financial services and inclusion play a huge role in catalyzing development progress. Um, there are several ways that have been really highlighted for how DFS encourages and really catalyzes impro improvements and progress towards the SDGs. So I'll just highlight a few here. We see DFS being used to help families cope with shock and receive government payments can help to prepare for unexpected healthcare costs through microinsurance. We're gonna talk more about that um, with our, our, my other colleagues and panelists today. Um, we also see an opportunity for DFS to provide better granular data, uh, especially from, um, you know, especially about people and about products that generally um, we do not have good data on. So this is better data about women that can help us to inform better policies and products. We see um, DFS being used to be able to um, collect taxes efficiently to prevent leakage, as I mentioned previously, by having transparency throughout um, the financial services value chain. Finally, there's even the opportunity for DFS to support um, helping us mitigate the risk of climate-related disasters, helping us make purchases and investments of environmentally friendly products. So it's clear that there are many ways in which DFS really helps us to catalyze our progress um, for our development goals in general. So now let's take a snapshot of digital financial services in general, particularly the mobile money space I'm going to focus on so we can kind of understand what these opportunities and challenges are to reach scale. So by 2020, over 5.2 billion people had subscribed to mobile services, which accounted for um, over 67% of the global population. So over two thirds of the population now have access to mobile services. Nearly two thirds of this growth has been in the Asia Pacific region and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is where we expect to see the most growth in, by 2025. We expect to see almost 610 million more subscribers globally to mobile services. So what does this mean? This means that the areas that are per, you know, particularly where there are the unbanked, as Sri mentioned, and also particularly where advancements in UHC could be really catalytic are, they are actually having access to mobile services whether it be access through a smartphone or through more uh, basic technologies. For those of us following this space, we also probably heard that there was a pretty monumental milestone within the mobile money industry at the end of 2019. So mobile money accounts surpassed 1 billion worldwide. And now mobile money um, is processing almost $2 billion a day. And where we see the most significant growth in these areas is in Sub-Saharan African region, um, in East Asia and the Pacific and in South Asia, which are also the key areas that we are focusing efforts on for UHC. So this shows that mobile money is becoming more accessible and being adopted. But despite this growth, what we also see is that only 36% of registered accounts were active in the last 90 days. So while we do see adoption and use, um, this does indicate that mobile money has not necessarily become the de facto way of, of payments. When we also look at the mix of mobile money transactions, it, we do see that more money is staying within the digital ecosystem or the digital economy um, with almost half of mobile money transactions um, uh, or a, a little bit more actually um, staying within the digital economy. But what we see here as well is that um, almost half still are, are cash in, cash out. So when we look at the, at also at the mix here, 
we can see the different types of transactions. We see that peer-to-peer -peer transfers still represent the largest value of mobile money transactions, both globally and throughout Africa and Asia. So we can sort of think about mobile money on a maturity scale and digital financial services on a maturity scale in general. Um, so we can consider payments at sort of the, the most basic use case and the most basic way to use mobile money, all the way building up from to savings, to borrowing or lending and credit, insurance and investment, and potentially even um, being able to, to use um, digital financial services for advisory services or, some, or consulting. So what we see now in the current landscape and what the previous data shows us is that mobile money is still primarily being used for payments. But we do see progress in these areas. We see that um, in, from 2018 to 2019, there are now you know, 39 percent increase in, save, in mobile money being used for savings. There are now 26 million unique customers that saved um, via mobile money in 2019. For borrowing or for lending, we see that there are more deployments being offered that provide credit. So this increased by 25 percent in between 2018 and 2019. And we also see that there are um, more, more insurance services that are being offered. 102 now are at the end of 2019. There were 102 mobile enabled insurance services across 27 countries. So again, while we see primarily that mobile money is, is being used for payment and is being used in a cash in, cash out sort of way, we do see that both from the supply and the demand side, there's increases up this maturity sort of scale. So now let's think about how the digital financial services ecosystem works and how do we leverage these advancements and the progress that has already been made in this space. So first, I'm going to set the stage to have us look at the digital financial services ecosystem in general. It's comprised of many actors and functions across the value chain um, with many interactions across all of these um, stakeholders and services throughout. So at its core, we have the customer who makes the payment or receives a digital financial service. We have network infrastructure that enables connectivity across this value chain. We have the digital transaction platform enabling customers. Um, this is the technology that enables customers to make or receive payments. We have the services and um, the, you know, the businesses that are providing those services, whether they be credit, savings, securities, loans. We have the financial institutions. They hold the money, the risk rating, credit, et cetera. We have retail agents. They enable customers to convert money, um, cash, in, in, cash in and cash out. And all of this is enabled through a mobile device, right, which is used by both the customer and, real, and the agent and really everyone across this value chain. So we've seen this significant progress. Um, and really this, this foundation that has been built within the digital financial ecosystem. And this has really been enabled by several key factors across infrastructure, technology, policy, and the regulatory environment. Um, so some of these things that have made this possible are, you know, when we think about people or consumers, we know that digital and financial literacy is increasing. Um, we know that cellular network connectivity is expanding and is more accessible. Mobile phone penetration has increased worldwide, both smartphones and um, basic phone technologies. We've also seen advancements in technology around APIs and interoperability that have really facilitated this information sharing across financial institutions um, and offered you know, an entry point for new services to plug in and to be able to share information. From a regulatory perspective, in some cases, regulation has um, enabled non-bank e-money um, issuers, so not having to go to the actual bank to receive um, to receive a financial service or, or credit or loan and having that be done through agents, um, which has really allowed for expanded reach of financial services and promoted financial inclusion. Uh, we also see that in general, transaction costs have decreased. So this has lowered the barriers of entry for both consumers um, and enterprises to transact on, within the digital economy. And finally, another driving piece of all of this is that we have more data, right? We have more data that means we have better insights into our customers and we can better tailor products based off of customers, which then continues to drive an increase um, in, in demand and an increase in the services being offered. So now what does this mean in the health context? How do we take all of this and leverage the foundations here, but kind of layer the perspective of, of health, especially in, in um, service of enabling UHC. So there are several key considerations and challenges that I'm gonna leave us here with today um, as we segue into the country applications and the programs that my colleagues will share more about 
as we think about scaling and really building off of the momentum within the DFS space in general. So I'm going to talk about this in thinking about the thinking about this in three ways, thinking about the patient, the provider, um, and also the payer. So there's still more that needs to be done to motivate, to encourage, and to empower um, people to take charge of their health and to save for health. Um, this is a behavior change component that we need to address, as we've seen in the previous data. Uh, mo mobile money is not necessarily being used for savings, and savings isn't necess necessarily something that comes, you know, that comes naturally. So we need to be doing more um, to be layering not only uh, digital literacy, financial literacy, but also health literacy on top of that. And really, um, digital financial services for health is at sort of that sweet spot of the trifecta of those areas. We also need to ensure that as we're using digital financial services for health, we're really ensuring that the most vulnerable populations are reached. That means both with networks, with devices, and also just within the, the ability to access the services um, that, that they'll be attaining through the financial services or through the actual health services that it enables. We also have added complexities about patient identification. Um, we know that digital financial services have helped to promote digital IDs and biometric usage in some cases, although there's still challenges there. When we have the added layer of health data on top of that, we have a whole nother layer of complexity around privacy and confidentiality. Um, and making sure that data, confidential data uh, remains private and secure. From the provider side, we have to look at this from two different perspectives. We both have the provider of the digital financial service or you know, of, the, of the insurance in this case. Um, and we, also, we need to be thinking about what are those sustainable business models that make sense um, to provide those services. And we also have to think about healthcare providers. How do we bring in healthcare providers and in, in interconnect them within this ecosystem so that we can, know, we can know what services were provided, who they were provided by, and, and where they were provided. We also uh, need to look at how, as Sri mentioned, how do digital financial services really align with the country's national digital health architecture um, and reduce fragmentation that already exists across information silos? Um, and this really gives us, you know, to the, the big question of really who pays for health services um, and how do we integrate DFS into kind of a digital first model for UHC at national public scale. Um, digital financial services can help to enable UHC, but it is not necessarily a panacea. And it is something that we need to have be integrated in, you know, to the public health financing scheme in general. Uh, and finally, as we have more access to data, as I mentioned on the last slide, we have a real opportunity here to make sure that we're using that data, um, providing feedback loops to ensure that our target populations are reached with the right products that really enable quality and equitable health services um, in an efficient way. So hopefully I'm leaving you here with some considerations that you can take forward and think about throughout the rest of the session today as my colleagues will share more about their programs um, and how they're integrating um, digital financial services for health in their programs and um, look forward to the discussion um, perhaps around some of these key considerations as well. Thank you. And now I'm gonna pass it off to- uh, Thank you, Liz. Sure. Thanks, 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 Liz. That was that was really excellent, uh, and thanks for drawing out some of those DFS enablers, uh, but also acknowledging some of the usage challenges and how they apply to the health sector. Uh, I think that sets us up well to now go through some in-country applications. I'll hand it over to Njide to discuss Pharmax's work leveraging DFS to advance the UHC agenda in Nigeria and Kenya. Thanks, Njide. Hi, sorry about that. Um, let me just share my screen really quickly. Um, just to mention, um, one second, let me share. Can you see my slides? Uh, it appears to be frozen. Oh, it's, it's frozen. Um, let me try one more time. And 
Or Georgie, maybe you can take over because uh, I'm having a problem uh, sharing it. It's not, okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. There's always uh, issues with uh, technology. Um, as I was introduced earlier, my name is Injiden Dili and I, uh, the country director for Farm Access Foundation based out of Nigeria office. Uh, Farm Access Foundation is uh, an international NGO and we are currently in five African countries. We're in Ghana, we're in Nigeria, Tanzania, uh, we are also in uh, uh, a few other countries like uh, Liberia with some of our, our, our products. Um, so I want, I think Liz and Sri have laid the foundation uh, to give some practical examples, but I want to start by kind of uh, giving the background and how UHC, Universal Health Coverage Interfaces with uh, Digital Financial Services. Next slide. So I wanted to uh, paint a picture. Uh, for those who know, have heard about Nigeria, always it's uh, negative uh, uh, information in the press. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to the healthcare system, uh, we try to look at um, the pillars that create either the efficiency or the inefficiency in healthcare service delivery. So we, when we look at the demand side, there's a lot of fragmentation and limited uh, pooling of funds. Um, there's a lot of out-of-pocket payment. In fact, we have one of the highest out-of-pocket payment with almost 95% of the population paying out-of-pocket. Um, and of course, this... Uh, uh, affects really the poverty rate because the more out of pocket you pay, the, the more impoverished you are. Then on the supply side, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's limited investment, low quality, you know, weak monitoring system, even the access points are very restricted. Then you top that up with the patient's uh, behavioral, you know, health care, poor seeking behavior, health seeking behavior, and the lack of trust that the patients have in the system. Now, this is kind of a, a vicious cycle because the low level of trust in the healthcare system results in the low investments and results in the patients not wanting to go into the healthcare facilities. Then cap that up with the governance structure um, where we have very weak uh, governance system. So if you look at all of this, it's, you know, it's a recipe for uh, what I would almost say disaster. So as Farm Access, what we're trying to do is to go back, stay, take a step back and look at what the issues are that are creating the bad uh, indices that we have and the system, the healthcare systems that we have and begin to address those uh, one pillar at a time and as much as possible infusing uh, technology or mobile technology within that uh, within our activities. Next slide, please. So just again, to give a context, uh, Nigeria is a country of about uh, 36 states and the federal capital territory. Uh, almost all the states, 35 of them have passed mandatory health insurance laws, except for one, which is still going through that process. Uh, but even at that, it's not about passing the law, it's about implementation. Uh, we have less than 5% of the population covered by any kind of insurance and, um, you know, the out-of-pocket payment, even though uh, um, the official figures say 70%, but we know that it's close to 90% because you go to the hospitals, they actually ask you to make a payment or deposit sometimes when you have insurance. So these are some of the things that we are trying to change uh, by supporting the government. And of course the population, now uh, Nigeria is the number one uh, poverty capital of the world. Uh, over 70% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. So you can imagine the, the, the impact of that. And on top of that, um, health is on the concurrent list. So it's the responsibility of the federal, state and local governments to administer health at different levels with different responsibilities. So we have the regulator who is the nat uh, National Health Insurance Scheme. Uh, we have the community-based health insurance schemes. We have the HMOs. And again, this has been devolved to the states to take ownership of uh, the implementation of their mandatory health insurance schemes. Just to put it in context, next slide. Um, just, uh, I won't dwell too much on this, but it's important to 
have a framework uh, in our support to state governments. We support quite a number of state governments to achieve UHC. And we find that so many of the different uh, states are different uh, stages of implementation. So when we go to them uh, and start uh, our discussions of support, we have a framework. Do we support you with baseline or do we support you with legislation or policy development or scheme design, uh, which is really where the, the expertise comes in as well as scheme, scheme implementation. Next slide. So our approach to UHC really is uh, to find a way to ring fence funds for care, uh, to find a way to start from the bottom up. Because if you look at Nigeria, you know, it's a pyramid. You have uh, the, the small percentage at the top who are extremely wealthy, who fly out of the country to, to receive care. Uh, in fact, we have $1 billion uh, leaving Nigeria every year of medical tourism. But then you have the mass at the bottom who don't have any access to care at all. In fact, Nigerians die more out of uh, either no care at all or bad care. So you can imagine the systems that are, uh, uh, that are lacking. At the same time, we have quite a number of implementation partners, donors, you know, so many vertical programs. So what we're trying to do is find a way to integrate uh, quite a number of these vertical programs into a horizontal insurance program so that uh, we are able to uh, achieve UHC, but not just implementation of the insurance scheme, but starting at the baseline of system strengthening um, on both the, the supply side and behavioral change on the demand side using some of the tools that are already available, which includes the mobile phone. Uh, next slide. So this is just to give you a scope of uh, where we are. Uh, we are in over uh, 12 states, some of them uh, also in partnership with several partners implementing at different stages uh, to achieve, of course, with the same goal, either strengthening the health system with involvement of private sector or uh, you know, experimenting, testing proofs of concept of what might work, but with the ultimate goal of achieving UHC with the ownership by government, because we still believe that uh, achieving UHC cannot be done by private sector alone. It's the government that has to hold the rein uh, to be able to achieve that. So next slide. So I wanted to go ahead and give some examples based on um, what Sri and uh, Liz had, had talked about before, because we really believe that um, technology has a huge role to play. If Africa is going to achieve universal health coverage, it has to be done using technology. And it's not, you know, the big robust technology, but really like technology. There's a lot of innovation coming out of uh, Africa. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we are leapfrogging quite a bit, as you must have heard, um, you know, 10% of the GDP of Africa is running through the mobile phone, which is far in excess of what is happening in, in developed countries, uh, Europe and, and the United States. But so these are some of the uh, uses or how technology can help uh, achieve UHC. One is fragmentation. Through the phone, you can actually uh, uh, mobilize local funding. Uh, you can mobilize resources. Uh, people can uh, transfer money to one another. Uh, you can, donors can put money in, in wallets. Uh, you can also identify the individual, which is a big problem in Africa. We don't know ourselves. We can't even identify ourselves. Nigeria currently is going through what you call a, a national uh, identification number registration, which is going to be tied to your phone. So uh, in another month, they're going to switch off all mobile phones that haven't uh, been tied to a national ID number. So you can imagine the impact that would have. Uh, it's all over the news. People are scrambling, even with COVID. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of criticism around that, but the mobile phone can help you identify the individual or give the individual a voice. So that is very key. Then in terms of uh, administration uh, cost and transparency, you know, it's just a marginal cost to be able to reach people. Uh, Nigeria, a country of 200 million people, we have 169 million active phone lines. In fact, 70% uh, uh, um, of the adult population has a mobile phone. So why can't we leverage on that technology in order to uh, you know, 
create access to care, as well as other amenities and benefits. Then, of course, pay for performance. Uh, this is now on the supply side. And most important is data. Uh, decision uh, making using data is actually quite lacking now because that data is not being collected. So technology is really an enabler uh, in this case if we're going to achieve UAC. So I'm going to now go into specific examples of what we have done uh, because as Pharmac says, we are not just um, a recipient of donor funding, we are also an implementer and we also put our money sometimes into programs just to prove that a concept works. Uh, so next slide, let's, um, so the first use case I will talk about is uh, CarePay. Uh, for those who are familiar with uh, CarePay, um, it's also called MTBA in Kenya. Uh, now, uh, for those who also understand the, the economy in, uh, in Kenya, um, MTBA is layered on M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a mobile money platform in, in, in Kenya, uh, but with a partnership between Farm Access and Safaricom, we are able to develop um, a wallet which holds the savings for, um, you know, enrollees, those who are interested in accessing care uh, in the healthcare system in Kenya. In Nigeria, it holds the insurance. In Lagos State, this is what we have rolled out to Lagos State government. So it is a platform that connects the policyholder, the payer, as well as the healthcare provider, such that you can almost literally have real time uh, flow of data, flow of funding uh, amongst the three. And if you look at the, the image on the left, which shows what the situation normally would be is that you have donors paying providers, you have individuals paying providers, you have government also uh, paying providers. So there's a kind of a spaghetti uh, situation going on there. But if you were to channel this through a wallet in the mobile phone of the user, then you can already cut out layers of administrative bureaucracy and wastage because the money goes directly to the patient. And now the power moves to the patient where they can already authorized their care. Uh, you as uh, um, the administrator, you can tell when the patient has gone into the clinic and better able to manage their care in that regard. So this is the first use case. Next slide. This is again uh, the same situation in Kenya. Uh, the National Health Insurance uh, Fund in Kenya is using it for registration, premium payment, patient management, as well as claims management. And to give you an example of patient management, for pregnant women who um, are using MTBA, uh, you go for your antenatal visit, you open your phone authorizing the first care. Uh, we know that you have to attend at least four antenatal visits. If you miss the second one, we already know that there's something wrong. So we either contact you or the provider contacts you asking if you're okay. So you can better manage the patient journey. Uh, using their mobile phone. Next slide, please. Then there's, this is just to show the dashboard of the different views. So as a participant, you can see your wallet, you can, you know, you can have access to it. You can actually have multiple uh, people giving you money or uh, uh, donating money into your wallet, as well as your own savings. Uh, this is the situation in Kenya and Nigeria. It's just insurance because uh, Nigeria is kind of a pay-as-you-go economy. We don't believe in savings. And besides, uh, the, the cost of service oftentimes is quite high. That for those who are extremely poor, I mean, it will take you forever to save uh, uh, to be able to access care. So we are promoting insurance instead of um, savings. Well, you, of course, you can save to buy your insurance. Uh, so this is what is going on, especially with the fact that uh, in Nigeria, 35 uh, states have passed mandatory health insurance laws, of which within that law, 1% uh, of the consolidated revenue of each state is designated into a fund to pay the premiums of those who can't afford to pay. And all this can be monitored uh, through the mobile phone. They have the provider interface and um, the payer interface. So example, National Health Insurance Scheme can see how many people have enrolled in one day. And all this is collected through the mobile phone and displayed on, the dash on a dashboard uh, in real time. Next slide. Um, this is just to show numbers. Uh, so in total, we currently have over 4.7 million lives 
on uh, the CAPE platform, both in Kenya and Nigeria. Uh, we have over 3,000 providers on the platform and millions uh, of, uh, of dollars in transactions have gone through this platform because we can now see the encounter, we are administering the claims and so on. Uh, so again, it, it better helps you to price uh, your products, the premium, it better helps you to organize and design and improve uh, the system, which uh, is beneficial to, to the population. Next slide. Second case use, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, each state, when they pass their law, um, uh, designated 1% of the consolidated revenue to pay for those who cannot afford to pay. So um, if you're in Nigeria, you quickly become poor. Uh, so there has to be a methodology uh, that allows you to uh, be uh, classified as being eligible for a subsidy or total premium payment. And this is uh, the, the multi-method uh, poverty screening tool, the PPI tool that we are using. Uh, this has been integrated into the, the, the mobile platform, such as a series of questions that you, you're asked, you know, where, how many rooms in your house, do you have a, a, a pit toilet as, you know, your, your convenience or do you, you know, they're, they're basic questions and it's a world stand, a world class uh, uh, process um, that we have adopted. We just digitized it and based on your responses, the system would then throw you into uh, an enrollment process so that you can en uh, enroll for the health insurance scheme or it would ask that you pay the premium for yourself. So this is another important tool. Um, and in fact, uh, we are now collaborating with the government of Nigeria because this tool can also be used for um, additional benefits, conditional cash transfers uh, to indigents and uh, people who most need it uh, and cannot afford um, healthcare services. Next slide. Uh, this, again, is another uh, very important tool. This is what we call the, the mobile application for tuberculosis screening. Now, uh, Nigeria is one of the countries with the least um, uh, ability to identify tuberculosis cases. So in working with Global Fund and IHVN, which is uh, um, Institute of Virology, uh, I think head office in the United States, we supported to design this application. Now, interestingly, when we started, it was really to run this algorithm so that we can screen for TB. But so far, um, it's been adopted by uh, the national TB program in Nigeria and used in 22 states. But we have integrated it not only to the uh, poverty mapping tool, but we're now integrating it to the KP platform such that if you, you're being screened for TB, at the same time, we check whether what your eligibility is in terms of whether you can receive um, you know, subsidy to enroll in the health insurance scheme or whether you can pay for yourself. In fact, Global Fund has even opted to uh, pay uh, the premiums for those who cannot afford to pay identified through this process, um, especially if they have TB. So again, you can see a variety of uses being streamlined into one application. Again, the ultimate goal is how can we leverage all the different funding streams into one stream that uh, uh, leads to universal health coverage and the coverage of the individual as a whole, as opposed to uh, disease profiles. Next slide. So this is just showing the states where the tool has been adopted. In six months, we screened over 30, uh, 300,000 people. So you can imagine the, the scope. It's, it's, uh, it's on the phone and it's being used by healthcare workers and health extension workers. So there's really no uh, extra work to be done except going through the algorithm. And uh, we've identified some presumptives and you know, have some people under care. So again, this is the power of um, a digital tool and how you can integrate that into uh, additional benefits for health. Next slide. Then uh, of course it's COVID, COVID, COVID. That is what is going on. Um, we, of course, because we are in the field implementing, supporting quite a number of facilities on the supply side, um, 
and supporting the state government like Lagos State to, uh, uh, to provide care and to market and implement the insurance program. We came up with uh, a system which was meant to provide free digital service um, in collaboration with one of the federal medical centers, FMC Abutemeta, as well as Lucy Technologies based out of Amsterdam. So it's really uh, a simple um, app that you can download from uh, the app store. Um, monitor your symptoms so it guides you through and if you have based on the algorithm you're a high risk for COVID it immediately directs you uh, to the healthcare facility where you can get tested you can get isolated you can get treated and this is all for free again just showing the power of um, leveraging mobile technology and on the next slide you will see the the numbers uh, as it were uh, next slide so in, in less than three months, um, when we started, um, we were able to reach through digital marketing over about 2 million people, but the people that actually clicked and reached out uh, um, in terms of communication that, that were interested based on the Facebook clicks and all that were over half a million. Um, and those who downloaded the app, 42,000 from, you know, so this is again, we were using the app to communicate information about uh, COVID because there was a lot of negative information, disinformation. Uh, in fact, in Nigeria, they said there's no COVID, they're lying. The government is just trying to make money and steal away the money that they're getting for support. Um, so we were using this medium to uh, correct the information, but also to educate people, but then direct them on where they could get um, uh, services. But again, you know, even though it was such a noble project, um, I can tell you that, again, this is where, uh, um, what you call it, learning comes into play, understanding uh, the thinking around the poor, uh, those who can't afford to pay. They were very skeptical that, uh, you know, this is not, there's something behind it, it can be free, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, with, with uh, mobile technology, you're able to either correct information or reach out to people who ordinarily you will not be able to reach out to. So I think this was a, a very important uh, uh, project that we started that has now been adopted uh, by the hospital itself. In fact, they've used it to create a call center uh, to care for COVID patients and to, to do home monitoring uh, through that call center. Next slide. Then the fifth use case, which is also very important, is digital lending. Um, for those who work in lower middle income countries, you know that a lot of the healthcare uh, SM, uh, facilities are SMEs. Uh, they're owned by mom or dad or, uh, you know, the, the, by a single individual who is unable uh, to access a funding through a bank, uh, through a formal process. Um, what we've also found uh, through a medical credit fund, uh, which is a fund of about uh, $40 million with investment from Calvert Foundation, investment from uh, the World Bank, IFC, uh, is to catalyze investment in the healthcare sector, to give banks and financial institutes um, a, a level of comfort so that they're able to lend to SMEs. So we do a lot of capacity building, not just of the banks, but the healthcare SMEs. So what we found is that there's usually lack of, um, you know, structure, uh, governance, financial management systems, and so on. Uh, so it, as part of our support um, for you to access the loans, you have to put in uh, some of this system, which includes a financial management system based on technology. And this has allowed us to not only to see the transactions within the healthcare uh, facility, but to extend cash advances and digital loans, uh, which they ordinarily wouldn't have gotten from, from a bank. Uh, so we are seeing this increasing. It's far advanced in Kenya um, and Nigeria is just starting up. And this again is through partners uh, with really uh, negotiated interest rates so that it's easy for healthcare providers to access uh, financial, uh, um, to have access to finance, to improve quality uh, within the healthcare services. Um, next slide, please. Then this one, uh, the health remit, uh, or we call it health connect, is a very important one, especially in Nigeria, because uh, there are quite a number of Nigerians outside of Nigeria that are sending money on an annual basis into Nigeria. And 
based on our, our research, um, the, a significant amount of the monies being sent into Nigeria is for to pay for healthcare services. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to speak to the Nigerian doctors in the UK, the association Mansag, over 200 doctors. And I presented this idea because we wanted to test it to see that um, if we created a, a transparent channel for you to pay for healthcare services for your relatives in Nigeria, uh, where you can pay for the insurance directly by yourself and make sure that all they receive on this side is, the, is access to healthcare services, would you do it? And the answer was uh, um, emphatically yes. Uh, so this is a way to support, uh, uh, we're currently piloting in Lagos. And it's a way to support and aggregate the fund so that it's not in a different pool, but the fund goes into the Lagos State Insurance Fund where the resources are pooled together and the risk is shared, right? Uh, and everybody, this also allows those who cannot afford to pay to access care. Um, so we are testing this and it seems quite interesting uh, as, as it were. Um, again, using the mobile phone, nothing more than that to channel uh, funding from the diaspora directly into a health insurance scheme. This is uh, one that we are also now uh, discussing with Global Fund uh, because quite a number of donors want transparency. They want to know where their money is going or even who the, 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 the money is going to. Uh, of course, a lot of this data is going to be blinded when it comes to utilization, but at least there's a comfort level that the funding is used for what it was meant, uh, uh, you know, designated for. So this is another use case. Next slide, please. Um, so implementation approach, I'll just rush through this. Uh, next slide. Um, really why we are focusing on technology now, especially mobile technology, as I mentioned before, over 150 million mobile phone lines. And the generation, uh, um, it, when I call Nigeria, out of the 200 million people in Nigeria, 60% are, are actually aged less than 35. You were a very young population. Um, and this population is actually quite active when it comes to social media and you know, using digital device, uh, devices. So uh, our thought process is how can we utilize you know, a device that's already in the hands of the people, uh, quite a lot of it, uh, smartphones, but they're also feature phones, which we tailor our innovations to make sure that they, ca they cater to those that have um, uh, feature phones. Then of course the pandemic has pushed uh, the adoption of technology forward. So we want to leverage on that. Uh, health has been the sector that is so behind in, in, in digital uh, adoption. So we are using this momentum. So now, uh, you know, in Nigeria, as well as Kenya, there's a, a wide adoption of telemedicine platforms, uh, sending money to uh, for, for payment for healthcare through the phone, payment for services through the phone, even utilization, monitoring, and dashboards through the phone. Um, this, you know, this is part of the reason why we want to make sure that we seize, you know, the, the, the benefit of this pandemic and not waste it. Next slide. Um, some inhibitors, I won't dwell too much on this, but you know, um, in, in Africa, even as these adoptions and innovations are, uh, are being developed, we realize that the regulators lack the capacity, first of all, to even understand some of uh, uh, the innovations and the benefits of the innovation going on. So we find that the developmental partners and private sector is far ahead of the regulators. So there's a need to, you know, make sure they're being carried along and brought up to speed so that they understand the benefits of some of the work that is being done. Um, there's a lot of fragmentation. So everybody is, you know, you have enough to just start your own innovation, but there's never enough funding or support to scale it. So, you know, because of that, there's very limited interoperability, uh, data protection, and so on. So there are quite a number of issues, uh, I think, that as partners, as, you know, a private sector, that when we are pushing innovation, we should just ensure or try as much as possible to, to take a step back and see how we can support or advocate for either policy or you know infrastructure or digital literacy or um, you know access to finance 
to enable some of these innovations at scale. Otherwise, you know, it's a nice concept. It remains of paper. There's so many in Africa. And I think that has to change so that, uh, you know, we can actually um, have the benefits of some of those innovations uh, um, to achieve UHC. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is these are just dashboards uh, to show some of the data that we're seeing, um, en enrollment, um, registrations, utilization, policy, all this are on dashboards. And we at the back end, we're looking at it and trying to advise. Uh, for example, you can look at uh, KW, which is Quara State Government, one of the states that we support end to end. Um, they started enrollment in May, then all of a sudden the government uh, um, who was now in the lead said they had no additional funding to, to commence enrollment again. Um, then we support them to help develop marketing strategies and train their people and so on and so forth. Then enrollment starts again and shoots up. So based on uh, some of these dashboards, you can then determine where targeted support is needed, what are we seeing to help define um, the policies or the, the, the regulation or even the benefit package. Uh, for example, 80% of the encounters that we're seeing are predominantly primary care, uh, aches and pains and so on. So uh, there's, even though there's a push for cancer within the country, uh, cancer was not included in the benefit package because of the kinds of data that we are seeing and all of this is on a dashboard and very easy to access, collected through uh, mobile data. Next, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, same thing with Kenya. We're seeing the same thing. Uh, in fact, in Kenya, which is far advanced, there, there are dashboards in the, the regulators' offices. So they even have uh, a tracker for their some of their enrollment officers. So if there's no enrollment going on in one county. Then they're asking where, where you know, the G, using GIS maps, where is the, the person responsible? So a lot can be done uh, using mobile uh, technology. Next slide. This again is showing patient encounter, how people are using the system. Uh, initially, of course, there was a lot of out-of-pocket payment. Um, then within a certain location where we started, and over time. Um, the the, the out-of-pocket dropped down and it moved to insurance. People were uh, starting out with four encounters a month. Then when they realized that insurance is here to stay, they were testing the system. And of course, they back off and only go to the hospital when they need it. So a lot of this information helps you uh, target your support and helps you target uh, the, the uh, kinds of um, you know, uh, uh, support that are given, not just to the providers themselves, but also to, to the patients and helping uh, behavioral change. Next slide. Oh, I think, that, so, so that, that, that's the last slide for me. But um, again, there's so many other uh, innovations which I won't talk about, but the, the, I think that the essence of my presentation is to say that, you know, with the mobile technology, which is currently in the hands of, of uh, uh, millions of Nigerians as well as Kenyans, uh, there's the opportunity to use that tool, that, that device to leverage additional funding, but also create access uh, to healthcare services and even monitor the, the kinds of uh, um, uh, health outcomes and the kind the care being delivered uh, in a more structured manner. So I'll end there um, and hand back over to... Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, NJD, for that uh, very excellent uh, presentation, super comprehensive, uh, very... Uh, Really appreciated seeing all the various use cases that, that Farm Access has managed to, to develop and deploy. We'd now like to open it up to the audience uh, to uh, administer a poll. Um, based on that and also uh, the, all the, both the previous presentations uh, regarding, uh, you know, which aspect of UHC progress you think uh, digital financial services for health um, can, can best serve. Uh, so I'll I'll launch the poll now. We'll leave it open for a, for a, a few few seconds and um, and look forward to seeing your responses. And we'll go through them during the uh, discussion at the end.
Great. Uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for those for those responses. Um, we'll now dive into uh, the the next presentation. So Matt will uh, will will go ahead and. Um, describe a little bit how DFS for H can support the UHC and agenda in a couple of uh, pretty different Asian countries uh, to what you've just heard uh, in, in Nigeria and Kenya. Thanks. Take it away, Matt. Great. Thank you very much, Sri. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I have to say it, it, is, uh, it is quite a tough act to follow Najide and also Liz and, and, and Sri, but I will, I will do my best. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, Common Health is a purpose-driven company uh, that is focused on using mobile technology to advance universal health coverage. Um, as an entity, we're relatively new. Uh, we, we started in mid-2019, uh, but really building off of uh, work many years before that um, through different vehicles uh, across, across Asia and also in, in Europe. Um, and so what I'll try to do today is just to share maybe a little bit of a provocation around this connection of UHC 2.0 and digital financial services for health. Um, I'll provide a couple case studies from some of the work that we've been involved in over the past few years. Um, and, and then also uh, potentially raise some questions that we can expand on in the discussion as well on, on the future. So, you know, the, the starting point and what I'm going to try to do in, in about the 20 minutes that I have with you is try to convince you that LMICs can leapfrog to UHC 2.0 um, using digital financial services and other mobile platforms. Um, and, you know, I, this is meant to be provocative because I think, you know, what we're seeing now is that even UHC 1.0 um, has had huge successes, but also real challenges. Um, and the question is going to be, what, what comes next? And where does that leadership come from? Um, and the reason why I'm hopeful about this and optimistic is because really LMICs have done this before. Um, and I think the other speakers touched on this, but what we see today, not just 5 billion mobile, mobile phone users, but 3 billion smartphone users, and interestingly, uh, that's really coming from places that might not have had very much access before. So even if you look at, uh, at a place like Myanmar, which really didn't have much penetration of telecom infrastructure at all a decade ago, uh, Myanmar now has mobile phone penetration, smartphone penetration that is roughly equivalent to Germany. So you know, there's a, a really uh, exciting opportunity uh, given digital financial services infrastructure, given other digital infrastructure for LMICs to define a new model. And, you know, it, it really is necessary because, uh, you know, again, we, 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 desc we describe UHC as really being about access to essential health services, financial protection for health. And we would also argue as common health that it also becomes important to look at addressing future health risks and mitigating those risks. And what we see looking at the context in Asia um, is that there are real challenges. And I think what you see, the main takeaway from the data overall, and these will be things that you know, many folks on this call will, will know deeply, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, but really what we see are, are challenges across all of those domains. So overall, uh, you know, really limited human resources for health, primarily concentrated in urban areas, uh, the second, and I think you know, this, this is uh, comparable to the Nigeria example, high rates of out-of-pocket spending on health. And what that means is that families are more vulnerable to uh, financially catastrophic healthcare events. Um, and this changing disease burden, moving towards more complex NCDs um, that are quote unquote, catching up to higher income countries. And then for the two, for the two countries that we focus on, Bangladesh and Myanmar, um, you know, if, if you look within that, Bangladesh and Myanmar, I would say, are, are pretty extreme examples even within that group. Um, so, you know, real challenges, as you see on the left, around human resources for health, um, very high rates of out-of-pocket spending on health. So uh, Myanmar is the highest in the region um, and still struggling with these challenges around, around chronic diseases. Uh, for example, there's 5 million people 
living with chronic kidney disease in, in Myanmar today. Um, and a, a, you know, a significant share of the population of Bangladesh are diabetic or pre-diabetic. So as far as this need for us to look at new models, um, you know, it, it, it really does feel like we're, we're going to need to find new models a, a get to get to a 2.0 uh, because UHC 1.0 is just, it's just not going to be scalable and it's just simply not going to work. Um, and just to dig a little bit deeper into this, this is just a bit of a comparison between Bangladesh and, and Myanmar. Um, what we see again is obviously Bangladesh's population is far larger, um, different performance and achievements on some different indicators, um, still relatively low uh, per capita health expenditure across the board and, and relatively low levels of, of spending on health as a share of GDP. Um, and relatively high rates of, of catastrophic expenditures at the 10% level. Again, some of this data, admittedly, this is from the latest data that we had on the WHO is relatively dated. Um, but what is really exciting is that we are seeing some shoots uh, of, of, uh, of opportunity coming up. Uh, the SSK scheme in Bangladesh is really a first experiment around uh, covering uh, households in low income areas. Uh, the SSB scheme in Myanmar has been looking at uh, formerly employed workers. Um, both of these schemes, I think, are an important first steps and signal the intention of the government to do more. Um, neither of these schemes really leverage, to a great extent, digital and mobile technology to drive to drive change. And so, you know, there are real opportunities there to add even more value through some of the platforms that have been discussed. Um, and in, in both cases, these countries have ambitious, uh, ambitious plans to get to universal health coverage in short order. Um, and you know, this, is, this is something where these initial projects are part of that. But also, I think one of the things that I've just been really impressed by through my you know, five years of li living and working in Bangladesh, um, followed by you know, a while uh, working in Myanmar as well, is, is an openness to try new things um, and to look at creative partnerships to bridge the gap and to accelerate progress on UHC. And I think that's something that has been really consistent at all levels of society and from all stakeholders that we've seen both in Bangladesh and in Myanmar. And so, you know, as far as those creative approaches that I just mentioned to engaging new partnerships, what, what might that look like? Um, and from our perspective, I think what we see is that digital financial services and those other platforms, particularly when we start to see higher rates of penetration on smartphones, but not limited to that, um, is that those, that creates a real, a real infrastructure and a foundation for achieving some things that we believe are going to be necessary towards uh, UHC 2.0. Uh, the first piece of that is going to be mobilizing new sources of health financing. Um, so many of you may have seen the report that came out from the World Bank in July of 2019 that outlined a, an annual health financing gap projected for 2030 of $176 billion. Even with aggressive revenue raising activities from governments, um, that gap would, was, would shrink to $122 billion, but still significant. Um, and unfortunately, what we're likely seeing, if anything, is that the, the fiscal picture for health in many LMICs, as a consequence of lower revenues coming in and broader economic challenges due to COVID, is in actual fact getting um, less optimistic. So it's going to be really important that we find new ways to mobilize sources of health financing that complement and support national health insurance strategies. And that can be from external funding sources, that can be from the private sector, and that can also be from households themselves. And digital financial services, as I'll share in some of these case studies, can have a really powerful role in driving that. Uh, the second thing that we believe needs to happen is we have to do a better job of integrating and aligning financing and provisioning. Um, we see that there is significant uh, misallocation of resources and, and real waste due to lack of alignment uh, between financing and provisioning and between uh, incentive problems across health systems. I think the GDA touched on some of these 
uh, from the Nigeria experience. Those are things that unfortunately we see consistently also across many LMICs. And so there's a real opportunity to get out of this trap that we see in high income countries as well of this lack of alignment between financing and provisioning and in actual fact outcomes for patients, which is really what matters. Uh, the third piece is looking at how can we scale up innovative care delivery models. And you know that has implications both in terms of reaching people, and I think Najide touched on some of those. I will share uh, more as well in, in some of our work on this. Uh, but also those innovative care delivery models really have the opportunity to drive outcomes and access without necessarily correspondingly driving cost and spend in the same way that say traditional brick and mortar approaches have taken. And so there is a real moment, we believe, uh, to scale up these models. And then, and then really the, the fourth pillar that we believe is going to be important is shifting away from episodic interactions and moving more towards proactive health management. Um, the likelihood that we are going to be able to get a handle on NCDs without a shift in the way that we think about delivering care for people living with NCDs or who may be at high risk of them um, is low. So we're going to need to figure out how we move away from healthcare systems really globally in both low resource and high resource settings that are structured for delivering acute episodic care and move towards proactive health management. And we believe strongly that digital financial services and mobile platforms can help us do that. Uh, but there is much more work to be done. So just to give you an example of what this literally might look like, um, as far as the applications of mobile technology, obviously one of them is really around expanding access to financial protection. And that can be both delivering a claims experience and a payment experience, but also mobilizing and collecting premiums. Um, as I think we all know from even our own personal experiences, telemedicine has really exploded as a new model for delivering care. And we're seeing that really across every single geography, uh, but also this ability to drive health education promotion and primary and secondary prevention, again, on this piece around risk management and the opportunity to meet people where they are. And, you know, I, I was so excited to see Najide talk about, you know, reaching people on Facebook uh, because we really do have all these other platforms out there. Not everything needs to be done um, on new apps. Uh, a lot can be done by what we would describe as meeting people where they are. Um, and finding the best way to engage with them where they are. So what does this look like? And you know, for us, I'll just share a couple, a couple uh, examples. So um, you know, one, one uh, project that, that we built and scaled uh, was uh, called Tonic. Um, this was launched in June of 2016 in Bangladesh uh, by Telenor Health and Grameen Phone. Um, and really the idea here was to bring together, as you can see here, several different components around digital health and health financing um, in, into a subscription uh, in a combined way. And leveraging both um, you know, the distribution power of telecom operators um, with the payment mechanisms available through things like mobile airtime to scale. Um, and over the course of roughly 24 months, we were able to scale access to 5 million beneficiaries, so the largest um, health insurance scheme in Bangladesh by number of lives covered. And then really the focus shifted to deepening that engagement to provide more comprehensive coverage. And again, you know, digital financial services played a role really across every dimension of this from looking at how do we collect what we would call subscription fees to support premiums for the insurance piece, but also how do we provide that payout in a way that is both efficient uh, for us from a, a resource utilization perspective, but also that is accessible for beneficiaries um, so that they can access benefits um, when they need it through mobile money instead of having to go through the process of creating a, a brick and mortar bank account. And I think, you know, this other piece around looking at opportunities, I, I think Shri and Liz touched on this on really routing more payments through digital financial services gives us the opportunity to leverage economies of scale. And one of the things that, that we focused on was on using our economies of scale to drive discounts and cost savings 
to reduce out of pocket through that mechanism. Um, so again, both leveraging from the financial services side, the risk pooling function of health insurance, but also uh, the strategic pur purchasing or um, you know, the provider negotiation aspect of health insurance. Um, and what you know, digital financial services also did is it really opened up new distribution channels. So what you see here is uh, a BRAC, uh, Shasto Kormi, who's a community health worker, um, who was selling tonic subscriptions through scratch cards. Um, and again, that, that's enabled both by cash transactions, but also more importantly, through mobile financial services. So, you know, I think tonic is a really compelling example of how through the right partnerships and through the right platforms, it is possible to scale up services that have a meaningful impact very quickly. Um, you know, the other case that I would talk about for us from, from Common Health as we look at, as we look at taking the work forward is on how can we really deepen both the engagement and the level of coverage uh, for beneficiaries to make something much more comprehensive and consequential. Um, but also how can we start to really drive integration? And I mentioned before that, you know, integrating financing provisioning we believe is going to be a really important part of enabling us to get to the next level of UHC. And that's something that we've really been focused on as Common Health is, is not just having those components, but tying them together. And for us, we believe very strongly that, you know, the first port of call for anything around health needs to be a healthcare provider and a healthcare provider who is empowered, not just to deliver care in that moment, but for that provider also to be able to do all the other things that a great GP does. And we all know that really in our experience, hopefully with our GP, that, that that GP is not just providing a consultation on an episodic basis. She's also making referrals, advising us even on issues around cost um, and, on, and on decision making, right? On helping change behavior. And so having the GP as the front door to health that then can start to connect people with resources, even in some ways serving as a caseworker or a social worker, we believe becomes very powerful. And we think that the adoption of telemedicine becomes a way to do that. Uh, but also when it is really coupled with um, high quality insurance with a great user experience, other supporting services um, and connected uh, through what we would argue is uh, online to offline. So really looping in resources from more traditional models, including in this case for a common Neuropod um, uh, factory clinics and looking at how do we integrate those clinics and upskill them so that there's a seamless experience through say sharing of electronic medical record data between telemedicine services and physical services. And I think what's exciting is that, you know, really there's an opportunity to, to do this work now with the adoption of digital technology and you have to have that be very cost effective. So really the ability to start with services that cost you know, at or below 1% of income level, um, ev even for folks that are low resourced. And again, looking at ways that we can drive even more value out of that. So you know, we're hopeful both with, I would say the, the groundwork that was really laid with Tonic to show that it's possible to do provisioning and uh, financing together to show that you, know, you can really walk and chew gum at the same time, that now the next step is integrating these pieces. And that, that's really gonna be a major focus for us now, both in Bangladesh and also through our work, our emerging work in Myanmar as well. Um, and again, you know, just to highlight a bit more about our delivery approach. So really our focus is on having a central platform that can enable all of these services but plugging into local partners. So number one, we never do anything um, on our own. Number two, we always integrate with both the public and the private sector. So um, it's important that we are agnostic about the providers that we work with. So that can include both people that are going to public hospitals and private hospitals, but also we're really excited to look at how for the insurance component that can be underwritten, you know, not only by private health insurers, but also that we can look at underwriting partnerships with national health insurance schemes where they provide the back end and that pooling instead of being done in a, in a private health insurance model that that risk pooling is still being done 
in the public sector. So we're, we're really agnostic about, uh, about, about where that happens. Um, and then of course, it's about really, again, connecting in both on the provider side, but also looking at how can we find new channels to reach people, to mobilize those contributions, particularly from informal workers, where the question around how do we get informal workers to contribute to health insurance schemes doesn't really have obvious answers. Um, and so looking at how can we drive contributions, whether those are voluntary or legally mandated, how can we make that effectively work from the informal sector really does take engagement at the front end from many local partners. Um, and, and we've been really excited to build that experience working with different stakeholders. Uh, so, you know, my last slide, um, before we, to make sure that we have some time for discussion, you know, is really thinking about this question on, you know, what does COVID change and what does it not change? Um, and I, I pose these as questions instead of as statements, because, you know, I don't think any of us really know the answers to this. And I think it's, you know, more interesting to think about these and to have a discussion around them than to uh, necessarily have a strong point of view on where we think it will go, right? Um, but I think one question that we have is, how are general consumer behaviors changing? And I think, you know, for us, some of the data that Liz shared around, look, we're still seeing, I would say, pretty stubbornly DFS being focused on cash in, cash out, and peer to peer. And while we are seeing some changes on the use of DFS for merchant payments, for recurring payments, uh, I would say prior to COVID, both the consumer adoption around merchant payments um, and the technical capabilities from DFS platforms to handle things like recurring payments and premium collections have been limited. And so I think one big question is how do we see COVID and these changes, you know, as Sri mentioned, five years progress in eight weeks, how do we see those changes impacting overall usage of things like e-commerce and DFS? I think the second is, um, how do we see health seeking and service utilization changing? Um, and, you know, back to this point around new delivery models, how much of that change in adoption of telemedicine will be uh, lasting, how much of that will be something that sort of levels out at a new normal that is higher than uh, previous usage, but but not as high as, as at the peak of the coronavirus pandemic? And then what are the other ways that COVID will change health seeking beyond just traditional telemedicine? So really having a, a, a point of view on that and evolving that understanding will be an important determination of where we go from here. And then I think the last piece is um, how are attitudes around social protection changing and how are delivery models for social protection changing? You know, I think we're seeing, you know, really exciting progress on things like cash transfers shifting from being done through physical cash through digital cash. Um, we're seeing social protection as an issue becoming something that is probably top of mind to a degree that at least certainly I have not seen in my career. Um, and what implications will that have for willingness to invest, whether that investment is being done by governments on behalf of their citizens, whether that investment is being done by the private sector or whether that is being done by families themselves. So I think, you know, we're in a really interesting time. Um, there is a great opportunity, again, I think to say, you know, not are, you know, can we leapfrog? but actually recognizing that LMICs are an actual fact leapfrogging today. And, and really the question is, how can we support and accelerate that leapfrogging? Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Sri. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for that, Matt. Super insightful presentation and, and, and really interesting to see how some of these innovative products you've worked on are able to address a current need, uh, but also have the potential to um, feed into um, government reforms at a, at a later stage. Uh, we now have a second poll question uh, for the audience. Uh, we've given everything you've heard throughout the session, we would like to uh, Hey, hear from you how what you think is the most important precondition for digital financial services for health uh, to support UHC aspirations. So I'll just um, turn that poll on now and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a bit of time to con consider the options and respond. Thank you.
All right. Uh, well, thanks. Thank you for all your responses. Uh, it's great to see a, a strong mix of responses. Um, and so now I'll hand it over to Aurelia to review some of these poll responses and also to take us through a, a moderated discussion question, um, session, answer any of your questions. Thanks, Aurelia. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Shri. My name is Arind Dutta. I'm a Senior Technical Director, Health Financing for the Health Policy Plus Project and also an economist at Palladium. I uh, thank all the presenters. It's been amazing hearing about the use cases and also hearing about some general thoughts on how digital financial services for health can, can help and benefit UHC. So uh, let's take a look at what you have told us in terms of the poll response on how you're feeling on this topic. Uh, the first question was a general question on how can UHC be best served by digital financial services for health? And we posed uh, some general points around UHC that, that, that we are familiar with around population coverage, health system responsiveness, especially paying providers, um, improving financial protection uh, through savings accounts, which uh, was a topic that Njide talked about, and then expanding access uh, to services through digital, uh, you know, remote delivery and payment. Um, and of course, we posed a counterpoint, which is that DS, DFS for H uh, cannot really serve UHC at this time. So the good news is that nobody picked that last point. Um, I think the responses are fairly even. Uh, we do not have a lot of folks uh, really going for the savings account option. We see a lot more interest in health system responsiveness and paying providers, which is already happening. Uh, I think we, we heard from use cases in Nigeria and Kenya where, where that is happening. And certainly the design in Bangladesh for Tonic and, and also the, the new Nirapod uh, product from Common Health has, uh, has perspective of paying providers. So that's great that our audience also feels that that can work. Um, and then we have some interest uh, in terms of expanding access to remote delivery, certainly the last mile barrier and how to span that barrier, how to leapfrog the last mile where connectivity through uh, fixed lines really never got to those places. We can leapfrog a lot of that challenge through digital. So I think uh, we saw some interest there. Um, insurance came in third, um, but I think this will be another issue that intersects with the question that was raised in the chat about trust, which I, which I will come back to. Uh, but I think insurance will, will definitely be uh, an aspect that in low insurance coverage countries, digital will, will help to be an enabler um, expanding insurance coverage, whether it's through micro insurance products like uh, the ones that Common Health has uh, and Matt Guilford uh, told us about or, or integration with existing social health insurance platforms as uh, what NGD told us about. Um, looking at the second question, uh, I think uh, this is an important issue around how we get there and what are the possible barriers? So we raised to you several you know, issues that Liz and, and Shri had talked about right at the beginning of this session. And I think in terms of what uh, you are picking, uh, it seems uh, the most important things are, of course, the regulatory framework. Um, yes, we completely recognize that you know, proper regulation can, can be much more than just a check or accountability system. It can really enable uh, that underlying sort of platform for growth, for, for a jump start. So regulation has, has a lot to do uh, and the government can be an important steward of digital financial services for health. But we also see here your interest and your continued reminder to us about how trust issues, I think one of the last slides that Matt uh, showed us uh, really sort of also brought us back to this, that if a user's trust in these services, uh, you know, doesn't sort of build up over time, uh, how how well does does the system perform, and can we can we really ex expand and scale up if the trust is is not there? So actually, uh, while I do have some questions that I want to pose to our presenters, let's start with the trust uh, question. Um, our audience member Diwakar Mohan uh, raised this question, which I think is very very useful as a frame. So there's digital com competency, whether the person on the on the user side uh, perceives themselves to be competent as and manage well the digital transaction, uh, understand the risks and the benefits. Um, and then on the other side, we have a sort of a trust in an abstract concept, uh, which is digital money. 
money that you know came in as cash and then got transferred and became uh, M-Pesa or some other uh, monetized form. So how well do these things work together? Do they actually go, in fact, hand in hand, uh, you know, trust and competency? And what can we do if there is actually a, a, a disconnect there? So I know that uh, while you know you were presenting, Matt and, and Jide, Shri and I had a quick discussion. So I'm going to allow him to start with some thoughts on this, and then we'll come back to both of you, starting with Jide and then going to Matt. So Shri, do you want to respond to Devakar's question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Arun. Uh, and I agree. It, it is a, a great question, one that I think is um, very um, at the top of people's minds, particularly around this trust uh, trust aspect. So I think um, there's there's a couple of things. One, firstly, of course, is the the appropriate regulatory framework being in place. But I think what we're also seeing uh, through, especially through the COVID pandemic, is that use is uh, is a really uh, important facilitator of trust um, and. Uh, you know, and Jide touched on this in her slides where she talked about one of the enablers being uh, mobile phone penetration, uh, being uh, the demographic div dividend. Um, this is actually what I think is, is going to uh, help to overcome some of these trust uh, and, and competency issues is that there's an increasing use of mobile technology and with that comes then the opportunity to engage with digital financial services uh, and uh, there have been studies actually that have come out just during the last few months uh, one done by by the bank looking at garment workers in Bangladesh uh, who who had to receive stimulus checks uh, through a digital platform um, in, in in recent months and what they found was that just that first uh, exposure to receiving uh, digital money and then being having to access it and, and being able to use it in the community was actually really um, pivotal and transformative in making these workers now uh, more savvy as uh, digital users of um, of their of financial services and also uh, having also some positive externalities to the businesses in the regions of the factories making them more aware of uh, what their what their rights are in terms of the the pay that they're entitled to so I think um, coming back to our, our original framing now really is the time to expand DFS precisely because there's been a kind of a, a forcing of use uh, through through some of these stimulus packages thanks. So in a way, what you're bringing out there, Shri, is that the COVID situation, because it 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 was a special um, event, a special risk, it uh, it maybe it forced on to a certain individuals and actors uh, the need to use digital services, whether to receive a social protection, social assistance payment, or to engage with their employer. And through that use, whether it was fully you know voluntary or not, there has become a, a sort of the a, a wave of, of usage that, that in itself engenders um, increasing trust. And I think we've seen this with other electronic and digital technologies where uh, first adopters uh, can lead to a demonstration effect and then engender trust among, among their communities. But I want to bring it back to Njide and Matt. Njide, would you like to talk about this issue of trust and competency in terms of use of digital products? And, and is that a barrier? And if it is a barrier, how, how do we overcome it? Okay, so I actually think that trust is quite fundamental and I'll use the case of Nigeria. Initially, when mobile money was introduced, um, those who tried to use it to pay for premiums, uh, it took on the average four days for the monies to get to the, uh, uh, the, the payer uh, who was collecting the funding. And of course, word of mouth, you know, they've stolen my money, it doesn't work and so on and so forth. So that totally, totally reversed any advocacy that had been done for um, mobile money, albeit in a very small segment of the population that was already trying to adopt it. Um, the, the second thing is that, you know, Nigeria, 39.8% uh, of the population is unbanked. That's about 60 million people. And unfortunately, these are the people that need the financial services the most, uh, as well as healthcare services and other benefits. So as far as the government is concerned, they don't even exist. We can't find them. We don't know who they are. So there is, uh, uh, there should be a need to, uh, um, to breach that gap. And th there's already advocacy that has started 
to get mobile money in, you know, uh, up and running to accredit mobile money operators. You won't believe it that Nigeria is as big uh, telcos as, as they are existing here. There's only one uh, that has been given that license and that's Nine Mobile. And you probably have never heard of Nine Mobile. There's MTN, there's Airtel, but the government didn't give them any license. So again, it goes back to uh, uh, vested interest of the bankers. Uh, because they are actually the ones blocking it. So regulation and understanding that, you know, the, the fact that these guys are using mobile money doesn't prevent you from making your profits uh, in financial services for those that have bank accounts. So there needs to be some kind of alignment, but it has to be seen through government and that people can use and can trust the system and not that their, their funds are going to disappear. So the reason why it's not, uh, uh, you know, the uptake is not as much as in Kenya is because the, the two giants, uh, the, the Central Bank of Nigeria, the uh, financial institutions, the banks are actually against uh, the uptake of mobile money, which is quite unfortunate because it could really, really open up uh, uh, the economy, just like uh, it has done in Kenya. So I think it's more about advocacy than anything. Now, that's a really important point. I mean, here is a case where, you know, unlike what we think should happen, where stewardship should really stand behind the mobile money system and the process, especially if there's a delay in the, in the account showing your, your balance, uh, which is really a moment of trust. Uh, here you have a situation where perhaps, as you said, due to lack of competition and certainly uh, regulatory frameworks acting more as a barrier to full market expansion and, and market growth, uh, we, we have a situation where perhaps the, the growth is not as fast as it could have been uh, compared to East Africa. So that's a very interesting counterpoint. Matt, uh, wh what are you seeing in Asia? I mean, I know the regulatory systems there can be equally challenging. But what's what's happening in terms of increasing trust, uh, both stewardship as well as from the demand side? Yeah, I mean, I I, th I think number one, it's an issue that we think about we think about quite a bit. So it's a really good question. Um, I guess the first thing that I would say is that you know back to your point about competency and the relation with trust, you know, consumers are not wrong to be mistrustful, right? So you know. Um, Th this this mistrust and skepticism of financial services is in place for a reason, right? And it's because a lot of people have had bad experiences. And 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 granted, you know that that might not have been from many of the players that are around today. But the reality is that you know that that mistrust was earned, and so there is a deficit that we that we need to overcome. Um, you know, I I think I think you know as everyone said. The opportunities that we have to show people that it works, especially around now, even with things like um, cash transfers and, and other types of payments, you know, that's a really good start. I think one of the big questions in our mind is how much of that trust will transfer to different applications, to, to, will transfer across different applications of DFS, right? So somebody may trust you that, you know, okay, you're, you're going to be able to get my money from me to a healthcare provider uh, and that it will actually show up. Now, whether that trust extends to, I trust you that when you say, I will pay your claim when you have to go to the hospital and that that will actually happen, that's a question, right? Um, and, you know, I think from our perspective, we think that there is a significant amount of work that will need to be done to build that trust you know, not just about general use of DFS, but around specific use cases. So it may not be enough that somebody has used DFS for a cash transfer. They may actually need to see that it works for insurance in order to trust insurance. Um, and we, we kind of don't know that, but that's something that, 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 we, that, that we need to see, right? How much of that is, is fungible, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, I think this is this is going to be an interesting um, area of, of even research uh, to help us understand how these trust issues manifest. Uh, we'll be looking at hopefully uh, a wave of in implementation research around around these topics uh, based on asking consumers. But let me let me switch to another question that came in through chat, and this one is to Njide. Um, of course, we have MTBA working fairly in an integrated fashion with uh, the National Hospital Insurance Fund in Kenya. 
and you showed us in your use case how the premiums can be transferred through the CarePay application. But uh, across Kenya and Nigeria, what is your sense of how willing is the sort of state insurer, the government-backed uh, health insurance scheme, whether it's at the subnational or the national level, how interest are, interested are they in using these digital technologies to and, and integrate them fully into their backend systems, whether for premium uh, or for claims management? Or do they see these as being uh, external and, and, and provide only lukewarm support, if, if any? Over. Now, this is fully integrated. Uh, uh, MTBA is the, the premium collection uh, platform for uh, NHIF in their journey towards UHC, starting with Kus Kisumu County. So any monies that are collected through MTBA goes, uh, is channeled directly uh, uh, to NHIF. Um, of course, there are other channels to make payments um, uh, to the insurance scheme, uh, either through the office, NHIF office, or I think they have other designated agents, but MTBA definitely is integrated into NHIF. In Lagos, that uh, CAPE is the platform uh, for enrollment. Uh, so from, uh, from uh, the payment of premium through uh, their web portal, uh, all the money goes directly into the Lagos State Health Insurance Management Scheme. So it's not, um, it's actually the backbone of operations and not just for collecting monies or premiums, but also leveraging, uh, there's a wallet layered in Nigeria, a wallet layered on top of um, on top of the, the actual premium itself, which is uh, receives funding from Global Fund to treat malaria and uh, HIV AIDS and tuberculosis. So, you know, we're seeing this as really the backbone of, of, upon which you can layer other financial services. And like I mentioned during my presentation, the federal government is now trying to use this platform for conditional cash transfer. And the innovations are coming out of it now they're seeing the possibilities. So uh, a, a person designated as, as an indigent gets about uh, 6,000 um, naira a month. Uh, I'll figure out how much that is in dollars. But now we're saying if you, if you save uh, 1,000 of that 6,000, which is not too, too significant, and over four months, you can actually pay your premium for a year. So if we're telling the government that, uh, that you can use this um, uh, digital channel to actually provide health insurance to these people who are, you're calling indigent. And so we're seeing that, again, another example in Lagos State, there is a scheme where you give loans to healthcare SMEs. Uh, it's, uh, you know, artisans, it's a way of supporting small businesses. And now we're in, into that loan repayment, uh, they've bundled the annual premium such that it's, you know, it's spread over a year because we said to them, if you give them a loan and they go off and die or they're ill and they can't even treat themselves, then what benefit do you have? So we're looking for now innovative ways uh, to leverage other services uh, into this health insurance. So yes, it is the backbone of the operations, not just in Lagos and Quara and some of the states that we are supporting. That's good. What, what you bring up there, I wanna to touch on it and uh, pose uh, maybe our last question uh, to uh, Liz and Shri. So I think uh, what Njide mentions there at the end about how to layer different financial services and reach uh, different populations, maybe you know these are populations that have different needs as well, social protection needs, social health insurance needs, or access to finance uh, in the case of, uh, of a small business owner. Um, you know, obviously this is bringing up an uh, issue of multi-sectorality because there's the health uh, sector involved, but there's also the social protection sector involved and possibly the economic growth, um, industrial, uh, you know, uh, industrial progress uh, sector involved. What do you think we can do to promote this? Or do you think that technologically, in terms of development costs, it's probably still going to be a more sector-driven approach to DFS um, because we're now moving beyond health, DFS for health and social protection. So in your sense, uh, what can be done to increase multisectoral action, um, but also what are the possible barriers? So let's start with Liz. Um. Thanks, Aaron. 
This is a great question, and I think it's it's clear from all the presentations today that there's you know there's no way to go about this alone just for health. Um, just like there's no way to go about you know UHC 2.0 from just a health lens, right? And I think that's true when we layer in the digital um, aspect of this as well. Um, you know, I think there have there have been significant improvements in trying to link um, social protection in general to 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 um, health protection, and you know we're seeing that within how information is being shared across different sectors, you know, really trying to reduce this, the silos across different vertical systems, even within health, but outside of health. Um, so I think, you know, information in general is a, is a huge enabler of that um, to break down those silos. And I think it's clear from the first question about trust that this absolutely has to be integrated within to um, improvements within you know, the digital financial services sector in general and banking and regulation. We can't do this without having having that trust built in the system and having the buy-in from the banks, as, as Njide said. Um, I think, you know, there's also, there's several other layers of integration, you know, just even within the health sector that we need to be considering, um, you know, thinking about how, and we've touched on this briefly, but how do, does DFS for health fit into the overarching, you know, digital health ecosystem and digital health architecture in a country? Um, and really linking it back to the, you know, the general approach for, for UHC. I think, you know, it's interesting when you look back in NG Day's slide about um, how they designed the scheme, you know, we saw, you know, a big slide with lots of different components across, you know, the, uh, across the entire spectrum. And there's one little component, right, that's about digital or ICT or technology, right? And I think that's key that, you know, it's, it's technology and digital as an enabler, but it really can't, you know, fix, you know, it really can't, create a system that doesn't exist, right? So I think we have to be thinking about it in the context of the program um, uh, that is already established and really be using it as an, as an enabler and a facilitator um, of those linkages and reducing you know, that fragmentation in the spaghetti that uh, in GDA slides also clearly you know, pointed out. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Shri, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, sure. I, I think I agree with everything Liz said. Um, also agree that it is a, a very complex issue to to try and address. But you know, I think for us to fully uh, appreciate the the benefits of of DFS, uh, an integrated approach is one that would allow the, the the scale effects as well as the efficiencies efficiencies to be fully realized. Um, but but. But to the point about multi-sectorality being a, a major challenge in, in actually facilitating this, uh, I think a, a perhaps a more incremental approach may be may be um, advantageous um, to, to serve the, 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 more, the most pressing or priority needs of a particular population with uh, a, a DFS 4 H enabled um, solution, whether that be health insurance, uh, premium payment, for example, and then tying in additional functionalities uh, if that would be potentially, you know, finding providers, networking with them, and then facilitating uh, provider payments at some point. That would, I think, be probably the, the, um, the, the most, um, uh, feasible approach to, to addressing this question. And then obviously building into um, uh, a broader social protection framework uh, will be, will be, will be the, the end goal, uh, recognizing that you know, health, health protection is really just one subset of the broader social protection needs for um, an, an individual or population. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. So much hope, uh, so much promise. Uh, I wanna ask uh, Matt uh, for his absolute soundbite type response on this. So Matt, all this potential exists, all, you know, so we are talking about so much uh, in terms of the ability of the technology, but what about the feasibility of the technology for the operator? I mean, do you think that this technology, the DFS for Health uh, expansion, can be can be profitable and can cover the cost of software development, all the way to ongoing operation? Uh, do, do you think that this has legs in terms of financial viability? So, so thanks, thanks, Arin. Um, that's a complicated question for a soundbite, but I'll I'll, I'll, try, I'll try my best. I mean, um, I think that so the the soundbite is yes. Um, if I if I'm allowed a, if I'm allowed a couple more sentences, I think what I would say is um, yes, but also I think we need to be thoughtful about how are we balancing impact and viability, and what and what I what I mean by that is look I I don't think there's I don't think there's any question that there will be economically viable models um, around leveraging digital financial services for health. 
many of those will be driven by the private sector venture capital ecosystem, right? That, that will just happen. Um, I, think, I think the question on those models will be, are those impacting the people that need it most, right? And the answer to that is less clear. So, what, so our view is, you know, and, and I, I, I say for us, and I would say probably to some extent uh, for farm access, but I won't speak for Energide, you know, we're kind of trying to thread this needle between being viable, but also not only serving the, the top end of the population. And I think, you know, one of the things that we do need to look at is it, it may be that to really reach through viable models, families at the base of the pyramid, families in the lower middle class, that that education and literacy around these products and that demand generation may need some support. So I am 100% bullish about there being an opportunity here. I think the question will be, how do we make sure that that opportunity is focused on serving the people that need it most? And that may need um, some catalytic investments. Over. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Matt. Um, that helps. Uh, I think so. Just to sum it up in terms of what we've heard over this exciting, interesting webinar, you know, this is a digital moment that we're living in. It's no longer a question around innovation or digital innovation added on to an existing stream, uh, a financial uh, payment or a financial service. We are already in a digital age. So I think what we're talking about here is that the first movers have moved. Now the question is, uh, do we have a follower pack that can now expand on those services, continue to add use cases, and most importantly, start to integrate these uh, uses, these functions in a way that totally and fully serves the needs of vulnerable populations as well as the middle classes. And I think we are going to see that uh, It's just a question of uh, where and when. And I think the trust factors that we have raised in this conversation are going to be important, but certainly that's where the government stewardship and the government interest in scaling up these technologies has to feature. And we have to get past uh, you know, uh, barriers that some particular regulatory system may have placed. And I think that is going to happen because the pressure for, from the demand side is just going to mount. Um, so this is really an exciting moment. Uh, it has been an exciting moment for a while and COVID has certainly made it even more acute. So let's keep watching this space. Uh, I wanna thank our presenters and of course uh, the HSR conference um, organizers for this opportunity to talk about this subject. And hopefully you will see this recording available um, through our organizations at a future date. So thank you very much for your time and Hope you have a very good day or good evening, wherever you are. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.